This morning we'd like to draw your attention to verse 19 of chapter 59. Isaiah 59, 19, the second part of the verse, or 19b. Here we are told, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. We who have received Jesus Christ into our lives, who have been born again by the Spirit of God, are very aware of the fact that we are facing a very powerful, strong, diabolical enemy. David made reference to the enemy in the psalm that you have been a strong tower from the enemy. Here we are told when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise the standard against him. Paul tells us in Ephesians that we really wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against these spiritual entities, that dwell in these high places. And therefore it is important for us that we stand and that we be clothed with an armament whereby we might be able to stand against the enemy that we face. The real battles of our lives are of spirit nature. However, they are both internalized and they are external. You see, when God created the universe, sometime back before the creation of man, God created angelic beings. They were in different authorities and ranks and levels. They are listed in the Bible many times as principalities, powers, for. Uh, authorities, mights, dominions, thrones, and these are all rankings of these spirit beings. Among these spirit beings that God created, there was one special spirit being of excellent wisdom and beauty. He was described in the scripture as being perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom, and perfect in all of his ways until the day that iniquity was found in him. That iniquity, we are told by Isaiah in chapter 14, was his willing against the will of God in the seeking to exalt himself. I will exalt myself. That's self-exaltation. I will exalt myself above the stars of God. I will sit in the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the stars. I will be like the Most High. So in his willing against the sovereign authority of God, suddenly within the universe there came a secondary government. Now up until this point the whole universe was flowing in beautiful harmony with God. There was only one government in the universe, the government of God, the government of light and life, and everything flowing in harmony with it. But now a secondary government has been formed with Satan as its leader, and it is a, govern a government of death and darkness. Revelation chapter 13 would indicate that he was able to attract a third part of the angelic beings in his rebellion against the authority of God. And so now the world, the universe, is at odds. These spirit forces in opposite camps are in conflict with each other. The light against the darkness, the good against the evil. Now when God created man, Man became the focal point of this spiritual battle. And man today continues to be the focal point of a spiritual battle. So around us 
and through our lives, there rages spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against these principalities and powers. And I am in the midst of a spiritual conflict as these spirit forces war around me. Now the purpose of the enemy is to draw me away from fellowship with God and to destroy me. He is indeed an enemy to me, though many times he disguises as a confidant and a friend. His ultimate purpose is my destruction. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and that more abundantly. But the enemy has come to rob, to kill, to destroy. And Satan wants to rob you of God's work in your life. He wants to destroy you and your fellowship with God. And so here I am in the midst of this conflict. Now the method that Satan uses is to appeal to the baser nature in order that he might make man a slave of his own flesh. So he appeals to the flesh. Now you see, the moment I was born again, that was a spiritual birth. I was born many years ago, a natural birth of the flesh. In time, I became born again, a spiritual birth by the Spirit. Now, the moment I was born again by the Spirit into a spiritual life, there developed within me a tremendous warfare as my fleshly nature began to war against my spiritual nature and my spiritual nature began to war against my fleshly nature. And the enemy would come to my fleshly nature and seek to appeal to it in order that I might yield to it and come under its power, under its authority, and become a slave to my flesh. Now it is very easy for a man to become a slave to his own flesh. The more obvious forms are manifested in alcoholism or in drug addiction, where you see a person who is hopelessly caught in a drinking pattern and he cannot seem to extricate it himself from it, though he will acknowledge that it is destroying him, it's destroying his family relations, it's destroying his business, it's destroying his ability to... Uh, to exist, and yet he continues and persists in his alcoholism. He is its slave. For the effect of yielding to my fleshly baser nature is that of becoming a slave to that nature. Now that's a very obvious form of it. Now in more subtle forms, I have met so many people who have become the slaves to their own sex drive. I have talked to so many men involved in an affair and you point out to them what it is doing to them, what it's doing to their family, what it's doing to their children. Can't you see the hurt in the eyes of your children? Doesn't that bother you? Oh yes it does. But there seems to be some power, some force that holds them in this relationship. Though many times they hate themselves and hate themselves for what they are doing, they have these horrible mixed emotions and it drives them almost to insanity as they're trying to deal with their own feelings. As they have given themselves over to an illicit sexual relationship and they have become then the victim and the slave to their own flesh. 
And that is the purpose of the enemy, is to bring you into the bondage of your own flesh, which is destroying you. The enemy comes to pervert that which is good, that which is right, and that which is natural. You see, these fleshly drives that we have were created by God and they serve the purpose of keeping you alive. We have within our bodies a marvelous little monitoring system that is constantly monitoring the moisture level within your body. Your body has to maintain a certain moisture level to exist. If you don't maintain the moisture level, you'll dehydrate and you'll die. Your body needs so much moisture and so it is constantly monitoring the moisture level. And if the moisture level draw, drops below a certain dangerous level, then this little monitoring system sends the message to your brain telling you that you are thirsty. You better get something to drink. Several years ago, we were out on the desert, the other side of Las Vegas, where we had car problems. And we were stranded in heat that was 120 degrees in the shade. And our bodies were quickly dehydrating. And I cannot describe to you the thirst that I had. It was just absolutely overwhelming. All I could think of is, I've got to get something to drink. We were almost to the place of, of opening up the pet cock on the radiator and drinking the water out of the radiator. We were so thirsty. This little monitoring system was saying, hey, you're in big, big trouble. You better get something to drink in a hurry. And my throat was dry and I just felt this aching for something to drink. That's all I could think of. I've got to get something to drink. Now, that is a God-given little balance system marvelously designed by God to keep me alive. If I didn't have that strong thirst drive, I could dehydrate and never know it and, and die of dehydration and never really realize what's happening to me. But God has built that system in there and it's marvelous. It's, it's ingenious. However, there are some people who have changed the natural use of that system. And they begin to develop a thirst for that which destroys their brain cells and that which is destroying them. And changing the natural use of this function of the body and giving over to an unnatural use, that same thirst drive can destroy. It's meant to preserve a person, but can it, it can destroy and has destroyed so many people. Some six million people a year are dying of alcoholism. So, you see, the normal God-given function, by perverting its use, becomes a destructive force. Now, the same with the sex drive. God is, God is the one that has placed it there. It's a marvelous, beautiful gift of God in order to bring us together, to make an attraction for our wives, for this cause. God made them male and female. And thus a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. And, and that whole drive is a part of God's beautiful, glorious system of, of the perpetuating of the human race. If we didn't have that, you wouldn't be here today. Because <laughs> way back there, Adam would have never been interested in Eve. Or it just wouldn't have followed along. The, the race would have dry, died out a long time ago. Except that God put this beautiful drive in us and made it such a fulfilling 
experience. And yet there are people who take that natural, beautiful, God-given drive and they twist it and they turn it. And so Paul the Apostle speaks in Romans chapter 1 of those who have turned from the natural use of their bodies to that which is unnatural. Changing the natural use. Thus women being attracted to women changing the natural use of their bodies. And men turning from the natural use of their bodies, becoming involved with other men and, and the destruction that it brings. But what it also brings is an enslavement so that those who are in that gay community declare that this is the way I am, I can't help it. It is true that they can't help it because they have given themselves over to this lifestyle and thus they have become the slave of their own lust. Your lust will enslave you always. You give yourself over to your lust and it's going to bring you into bondage. It's going to bring you into slavery. Now, when the enemy comes in like a flood. This is recognition of the fact that there are times when the temptations are greater than others. Many times we can maintain very well. There's no problem. I'm not really being tempted. It seems that things are going quite well and I'm in good shape. But then there come periods where it seems like the enemy comes in like a flood in such a forceful, overwhelming way that I just don't seem to have the capacity to withstand this onslaught. You may be an excellent swimmer and you may be able to maintain yourself in the water under normal circumstances. But try to swim out of a flood, out of a torrent, and you find that you're just helpless as you try to swim against that fierce current. It just continues to carry you on downstream and no, lo no matter how strong you are, you're just carried by that flood. And in our spiritual experience, it seems that for the most part, we're able to maintain. But there come those times when the enemy seems to come in like a flood and it's totally devastating. It's overwhelming. I don't have the capacity to, to fight against it. It's bigger than I am. And that is what the prophet is referring to. Those experiences when the pressure and the power is just so overwhelming that I don't have the capacity myself to withstand. I recognize that those forces that are against me are more powerful than I am. I am no match for the enemy. I don't have the strength to resist the flood. Does that mean that I am doomed? No. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That is when God's Spirit begins to work and he lifts up the standard against the enemy. I don't have the capacity to do it myself. I've done everything I know, but I'm still falling. And I cry out to God and the Spirit of God lifts up the standard. You see, my problem isn't with my spirit. My spirit loves God. My spirit wants to serve God. My spirit wants to do what's right. My spirit is willing, wanting to live a perfect life before God. My problem is my flesh. It's weak. You remember when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, would you pray with me for an hour? 
And soon Peter was asleep, and Jesus woke him up and said, Peter, can't you pray for just one hour? Watch him pray, for your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. Oh, Peter, move over. Let me sit down with you. I can identify with you. Because my spirit indeed is willing, with my mind, with my spirit, I serve the law of God. I want to serve God. I know it's the only rational, reasonable way to live. But my flesh is weak. And the enemy comes in attacking my flesh, drawing me after the flesh. And it's like a flood. It seems to overwhelm me. But in that hour, in that moment, the Spirit of the Lord lifts the standard against him. For you see, though the enemy is more powerful than I, he is not more powerful than the Spirit that dwells within me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So I am no match for the enemy, but the enemy is no match for the Spirit. And that is why the Spirit is the one that lifts the standard against the enemy because I don't have the capacity to lift a standard against him myself. But the Spirit lifts the standard against the enemy. Jesus said, Ye shall receive power after the Spirit has come upon you. And that glorious dynamic of God's Spirit in my life is greater than the power of the enemy that is opposing me. Now the standard that the Spirit lifts against the enemy is the Word of God. As you'll notice in Ephesians where Paul talks about this spiritual warfare, he tells you all of the, wep all of the armament that you have for defense, but then he gives you one offensive weapon, and he said, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that is oftentimes my strongest defense, is a good offense. And so God has given me the offensive weapon of the Word to use against the enemy. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit lifts up the standard, the Word of God, against the enemy. The enemy came in like a flood against Jesus Christ. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and was hungry. The body balances were working. The monitoring system was telling him, you're starving to death, you better get something to eat in a hurry. Now I've gone a day without food and felt famished. Imagine what it would be to go 40 days and 40 nights. Not only famished, but no doubt physically weakened. And Satan seems to know when to attack and where to attack. He always seeks to attack us at our weakest moments. That's when he seems to come in like a flood. When I am weak, taking advantage of my weakness, he moves in like a flood and he came to Jesus who was hungry and weakened after 40 days of fasting. And he said, hey, Command this stone to become bread so you can eat it. Take your supernatural powers. Use them to fulfill your own fleshly desires. Satan still uses this and destroys so many people by it. Take the supernatural gift of God in your life. Take those supernatural powers and use them for your own enrichment. Use them for your own benefits. But Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. The standard that was raised against this onslaught of the enemy was the word of God. It is written. The standard was lifted. Again, Satan came to him and took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, all of these will I give to you and the glory of them if you will bow down and worship me for they are mine and I can give them to whomever I will. 
Jesus had come to the earth for the purpose of redeeming all of these kingdoms. He had come to redeem the world back to God. Now, in the plan of God, he was to be despised and rejected of men. He was to go to the cross and suffer the shame and the ignominy of crucifixion in order that he might redeem the world to God. Satan is saying, hey, got an alternate plan for you. You don't have to take God's path of the cross. You don't have to go that painful route of the Father. You don't have to wait. I'll give it to you right now. You can have immediate fulfillment. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll give it to you now. You don't have to follow God's path of the cross, the painful path of the cross. And how often Satan comes to us and says, Hey, you don't have to follow that path of self-denial. You don't have to follow the path of the cross. You can have immediate fulfillment. I'll give it to you right now. Just here's the experience, and this will bring you what you're looking for. You'll find the pleasure, the joy, the excitement. You'll find what you're wanting right here. Move from God's plan. Here's an alternate plan. Just follow me. And so many people are being led astray with the inducement of immediate fulfillment rather than following God's path of the cross. Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. The word of God was the standard that was lifted against this onslaught of the enemy. And so always, the standard that the Spirit raises against the enemy's coming in like a flood, is the Word of God. It becomes the place of strength, the place of defense, God's Word, against the temptation that Satan has placed in my path. As David said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart, O Lord, that I might not sin against you. God's Word hidden away in my heart becomes defense and strength against the flood of the enemy against me. The Spirit raises the standard. Thus, it is very important for me to hide the Word in my heart, to saturate my life in the Word of God. For as I am saturated in the Word of God, then I will keep a proper perspective on things. And when Satan comes in like a flood, the Spirit can just raise that standard, the Word of God, and I have that Word and that place of strength in the Word. It is written, and it becomes the guide for me and that, that strength for me when I'm overwhelmed. Now, what should I do when the enemy comes in like a flood? Well, the Scripture tells us we are to resist the devil. So many times when he comes in, we're so overawed and overwhelmed by this flood and this attack. And, oh, that's Satan, man. I can't do anything against him. He's so powerful, you know. And I, and I just sort of get wobbly need, and I, I just yield, you know. I just, well, what can you do, you know? He's so powerful. And I don't really stand. I don't really seek to resist. I don't really stand up. There is my part. I've got to resist. I'm not to just capitulate or, or, or fall, cave in because the enemy is coming. Peter says that Satan is going about like a roaring lion. And so many times you hear this, you know, and, oh, you know. He, he just wipes us out with a roar. And we just, we're not really, we're not really resisting. We're not really standing up and resisting the attacks of the enemy. He said, Satan is going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfastly. Years ago when I was playing football, I was carrying the ball around the left end, and I saw this guy coming towards me to tackle me. This guy was all star. I mean, he was, you know, all American. He was, he was just good. I had read all about him in the papers. Vicious tackler, 
tough. And so when he hit me, I just folded. Because I thought, man, this guy's really, he's all merry. He's pro, you know, he's, he's good. And he hit me, and I just folded. Well, as I got up, a substitute was coming in for me, and the coach got me over in the sideline and started yelling at me. So what's the matter, Smith? You just folded when that guy hit you. What's the matter? Why didn't you fight? Why didn't you really hit him? He said, you shouldn't just fold. Now, he said, if he's going to tackle you, make him hurt for it. Now, get back out there and hurt him. <laughs> and so I went back out. And I saw him coming at me again. I thought, fellow, you may tackle me, but you're going to hurt. <laughs> and I just went into him, not folded, I just went into him with everything I had to make him hurt, make him feel it. And it was not long before I found out that he was beginning to sort of fold a bit when I would hit him. Rather than just yielding and giving in, we need to resist. Resist the devil, the Bible says. You say, oh, man, Satan came yesterday and just really wiped me out. Oh, boy, I just really, you know, he just really did a number on me yesterday. Man, I just, you know, I really fell. That was, you know. Oh, you did? Let me see your scars. Where are the bruises? Where's the blood? Well, I'm in pretty good shape. Well, how come? How can you still be in good shape? In Hebrews it says, You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Don't tell me of your capitulation unless you've got some scars. Let's see the results of the battle. Your problem is you didn't battle it. You just yielded to it. You didn't put up a fight. Don't go down without putting up a fight. Whom resists steadfastly. And then secondly, call on the Lord. Because no, no matter how hard you may resist, you are no match. But God has granted unto us that power that is necessary for victory. I need to stand. And as I stand in faith against the enemy, the Lord comes and makes that stand with me, and he gives to me all that I need to overcome. Everything that I need to be victorious is granted to me as I make my stand in faith in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't have to be defeated. I don't have to be a slave to my flesh. I don't have to yield to the enemy. I can have complete, full victory for Jesus provided for that on the cross when he destroyed those principalities and powers that are against me. He triumphed over them through the cross, and there on the cross he openly displayed his victory triumphing over them there. Now I can have that victory of Christ as I stand and call upon the Lord. He will give me the strength and the capacity to stand against every onslaught and flood of the enemy by which he seeks to destroy my life. And I can and will be victory, victorious through the name and the power of Jesus Christ whom I serve. And you too as you stand and resist steadfastly in the name of Jesus and call upon the Lord and receive that power. And the Spirit of God will lift the standard against the enemy. And as you resist the devil, you'll find he'll flee from you. And as you draw nigh to God, you'll find he will draw nigh to you. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the glorious victory that we can experience in Jesus Christ. That when the enemy comes in like a flood, 
we need not to be drowned. Lord, we can stand in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need not to yield to the temptation and to the weakness of our flesh. But we can be strong in the power of thy spirit and thy might, which is upon us. So, Lord, help us now to stand, to resist, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many of you this morning who have become captives to your own flesh and you find yourself in a self-destructive condition. You look at what's going on, you know what it's doing to you, but you don't have the power to fight against the flood. You've been overwhelmed. I encourage you to go back to the prayer room and find this morning the power of God's Spirit to deliver you from the flesh and from the damning, destructive forces that are using your flesh to destroy you. That you might go today in the name of Jesus Christ, in the victory that he has wrought for you, that you will no longer be a victim of your flesh and the weakness of your flesh, but you'll begin to know the power of God's Spirit in a new way, bringing you victory in your life. It's there for you. God wants you to experience it and have it. And I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room and there commit yourself to God afresh and anew that God might grant to you His power and His victory over the enemy. God be with you and God bless and keep you through the week. And may you be strengthened by that spirit as you are engaged in the spiritual warfare and as the enemy will seek to come in like a flood. May you experience that glorious power of Christ and his Holy Spirit as he grants to you his strength, his victory, and his power over the forces of darkness that would seek to draw you in to their captivity. God bless you, give you a beautiful week, a week of victory in Jesus Christ, in his name.